the pleasure trap, mastering the hidden forces that undermine health and happiness. Please welcome Dr. Alan Goldhammer. So I speak to you today uh, from the perspective of practicing for 30 years and working with about 15,000 patients through our inpatient facility at the True North Health Center. But I'd like to start off first by showing you a picture of a young girl. Her name is Kate. She's four years old now. And just coincidentally, she happens to be my granddaughter. <laughs> but she represents one of the most bizarre statistical anomalies that I've ever come across. Because Kate was one of 250 million babies born on the planet four years ago. But it turns out my granddaughter, Kate, was the cutest one of all. <laughs> what do you suppose the odds of that? People in industrialized countries are getting fatter. I don't think that should be a surprise to most of you. When I went into practice, just shortly after that anyway, uh, this was the percentage of the people in the United States that had achieved the exalted state of obesity. You'll notice that no state had more than 14% of the population having expanded the strategic fat reserves enough to qualify for obesity, which is a BMI of greater than 30. That is 30 pounds overweight on a 5 foot 4 female. But by 1990, obesity was spreading throughout the United States in a relatively short period of time. By 1997, you'll notice that they had to come up with a new color because now over 20% of the population in some of our southern states had achieved um, obesity. And by 1999, that obesity continued to spread. By 2001, yes, another new color. Over 25% of the population in, in the home of deep fried ice cream had managed to achieve obesity. Strategic fat reserves continue to increase every single year since then. And in 2005, another new color, as we got to over 30% of the entire population of these states. Not to be outdone in 2007, 2008, 2009. Finally, Colorado gave up its lowest status. By 2010, here we are. 2011, 2012. You notice they're making provisions. Always the optimists at the CDC. Not, nobody's quite broken the 35% threshold, but it's coming any day now. It's not just in the United States. Europe is also seeing increasing obesity levels that are rising geometrically. Um, they're not quite to the level of the United States, but you can see the range of obesity. The United Kingdom isn't far behind here. They say there are differences between <laughs> Europe and... We're looking at the diet differences. Now, be, behave yourself. It's not just uh, industrialized countries. Actually, throughout the world, obesity is rising to the point where now there are more people that are suffering from dietary excess than deficiency. So you still have people starving in certain areas, but you have more people dying as a consequence of dietary excess than deficiency. This is the percentage globally of the people that have uh, uh, increased in obesity throughout the world. I'm proud to say as an American that when it comes to achieving fat reserves, we're number one. <laughs> when spring comes late, we'll be all right. And in the competition to see who can get the fattest the quickest, you'll notice that we're up there around a third, but Look down here in Asia, some of these Asian countries, 3% obesity. It's like they're not even trying. <laughs> it's not just achieving obesity that we've done, but we've also dramatically increased the diseases associated with dietary excess. In fact, these diseases used to be rare. They were called the diseases of kings because it was only the wealthy elite kings that could achieve these diseases, but now those diseases have become epidemic diabetes, uh, not the least of which, we're seeing dramatic increases of diabetes, not just in adults, but also now 
in children and the cascade of health compromise that comes as a consequence of it will in fact become devastating. And the correlation between increasing obesity almost exactly mirrors the increasing incidence of diabetes and the other diseases of dietary excess. Now, if we look at what kills people, we go back to 1900, we see that people used to die from different things than they die today. You'll notice that pneumonia and tuberculosis, gastrointestinal infections, no longer make a significant part of the cause of death uh, today. Today it's heart disease and cancer. And the reason for that, some people misattribute to the miracles of modern medicine. But in reality, it's really not true. For example, most of this um, death from infectious disease here that you see now is virtually diminished is mostly diseases of things like waterborne illnesses. Okay? This wasn't about antibiotics, and for these diseases dramatically reduced long before the 1937 introduction of sulfa drugs or 1940 introduction to penicillin. These were improvements in public health, in hygiene. In the, we stopped uh, impacting um, people with disease through waterborne illnesses, etc. So what actually does kill people today? Number one on the list still is tobacco use. And the reason tobacco is such an effective tool for killing people prematurely is because it affects virtually every organ system. In other words, it's not just, for example, lung cancer that you get from smoking. In fact, 80% of smokers will never get lung cancer. Hey, how dangerous can it be, right? It's because they die from cardiovascular disease before they live long enough to grow the tumors. So I suppose if you wanted to have a cancer-safe cigarette, you just have to make sure that everybody dies from heart disease before they live long enough to grow the tumor, and then you could call it a safe cigarette. Right behind uh, tobacco is blood pressure. And blood pressure is interesting because it affects almost entirely cardiovascular health. Increased blood pressure results in increased turbulence that along with a greasy, slimy, fatty, dead, decaying flesh diet, high in lipids, <laughs> tends to accumulate fatty sores inside the animal lining of the vessels that break loose and cause heart attacks and strokes. So elevated blood pressure, which has now become epidemic, in fact, the majority of people in industrialized countries, if they manage to live to 65 years old, will have high blood pressure, major contributing cause of death and disability. Alcohol use. Now, it's interesting that if you listen to the media today, you'd think alcohol was some kind of health food. If you don't drink now, maybe you ought to start. <laughs> and they talk about Risterol being in red wine, and it's true. There's a few antioxidants left from the grapes that haven't been completely adulterated and destroyed in the processing of making wine. Now, they could tell you just eat grapes because it comes out of the skin of the grapes, but that wouldn't be very lucrative, would it? So we're going to play let's pretend and pretend that alcohol is some kind of beneficial thing, when in fact nothing could be farther from the truth. Now, there's also a blood thinning effect of alcohol, much like aspirin. So if you're on a greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, decaying flesh diet and high risk for clotting strokes, and you take aspirin or you take alcohol, there is a slightly reduced risk of a clotting stroke. Uh, of course, they don't tell you there's an increased risk of a hemorrhagic or bleeding stroke. It doesn't reduce all-cause mortality. It's just shifting which, which form it's going to kill you. So again, hardly health food. Not to mention alcohol is like liquid fat in the sense that it's got seven, which is slightly less than nine calories per gram that you find in pure fat, which is why people get, like, for example, men get those really attractive beer bellies when they drink alcohol. It kinda, and then they get that crack, you know, the plumber's crack. The chicks, <laughs> chicks dig that. Yeah. In fact, that's why they have the new jeans that come up two inches higher to, to hide that plumber's crack to keep those housewives from going crazy. <laughs> Obesity itself is a major contributing cause of death and disability. The things you do that allow you to be fat kill you. And you can see that it correlates pretty well with the other major factors. A low fruit and vegetable intake, actually, independent of weight, is associated with all increased all-cause mortality, probably because of that fruits and vegetables are our only source of the 2,000 or so phytochemicals that are sought to be protective in human health. Uh, physical inactivity, you also see not getting uh, up and moving around enough associated with ultimate cause of death, as is illicit drugs and unsafe sex. What's interesting, none of those conditions are deficiencies of vitamins, minerals, pills, potions, powders, protein, any kind of deficiency syndrome. These are all conditions of dietary excess. 
So if we're going to talk about not dying prematurely, we need to get off the idea that that's going to be coming from a pill, potion, powder, or treatment, and get focused on the things that do matter, diet, sleep, exercise. So question, do adults live longer today than in 1900? We know that um, life expectancy has gone up tremendously, hasn't it? Uh, life expectancy, for example, you notice Canada and Japan and Australia up there around 80. We're way down here. The United States is down here with Germany and Ireland and not much higher than Chile and Cuba. But nonetheless, life expectancy has gone up quite a bit. In fact, it was 47 in 1900, life expectancy. And today it's 78. That's 31 years longer. Now, a lot of people think, well, that's because of the miracles of modern medicine. Now we're living much longer. Are adults living longer today than they did in 1900? No. But well, wait, wait a second, I just said life expectancy went up 31 years. But let's look at the data a little more carefully. If you were 65 years old in 1900, you could expect to live on average 12 years. And today you can expect to live 19 years. That's a seven year increase. If you were 85 in 1900, you could expect to live four. Today, six. That's a two year increase. That means adults today live little longer than adults did in 1900. Well, what happens? What's the difference between 31 and 7? Where are those 24 years difference? If adults aren't living longer, perhaps the difference is a reduction in infant mortality. It used to be that 200 per thousand babies died in infancy, usually because of water and borne illnesses, predation, starvation issues. Today, only 7 per thousand die. And that's in the United States. We're not even particularly in good shape compared to some other countries. But that difference, that 193 babies that didn't die in infancy that lived to adulthood, adds 78 years per person to the average, which shifts the curve to the right. It wasn't that adults were dying at 47 in 1900. It's that a lot of people were dying as infants or children, and other people were dying you know, in their 50s and 60s uh, and, and 70s, much like they are today. Because adults today live little longer than they did in 1900. Now, that's an important point because we had a lot of improvements in public hygiene early on at the turn of the century. Water treatment and sanitation, food sanitation, uh, a resolution of malnutrition, elimination of overcrowding, and we also have less deadly medical care in some ways. Some things are less damaging. You know, you've got to remember, back in our history, they're bleeding people and using mercury and all kinds of crazy things. Now, instead of taking the blood out, we put it in. But in any case, the miracles of modern medicine one big thing was the use of lactated ringers or IV fluids because remember a lot of these people died from dehydration and so when we learned how to use intravenous feed that was a big deal that didn't come in though until around 1911 or so the first sulfa drugs weren't till 1937 penicillin didn't come about till 1940 so these had very little to do with the overall uh, impact this is a young boy this is a picture Again, another coincidence happens to be my grandson. <laughs> my grandson, um, his name uh, is the same as one of my heroes. His name is Colin. And now he's nine years old. So my grandson Colin, the other day I had to explain to him what it meant to send somebody a letter. <laughs> he is a constant reminder to me of how much the world is changing how old I am. He calls me his AO, which I thought was cute till I found out from my daughter that that stands for ancient one. <laughs> I explained to Colin that to send a letter, what you do is you take a piece of paper and you write your message down and you fold it up and you put it in an envelope. And you write the name and address and the zip code of the person you want it to go to and then you purchase a stamp and you affix the stamp to the envelope and you give it to somebody who takes it to the post office and puts it in a sorting machine and they sort it and they give it to somebody who gives it to somebody else and a week later, hopefully, they deliver your message to the other party. And he said, oh, Grandpa, I know all about that. We studied that in school. It's called the Pony Express. He said, Grandpa, that's just silly. He says, you give it to me, and I scan it and email it, and it's there in 45 nanoseconds. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Colin, I'm very proud of you that you know all about computers and email and scanning and nanoseconds. And he says, well, why are you so impressed, Grandpa? And I said, because when I was a little boy, we didn't have computers. And he said, oh, Grandpa, 
Were you poor? <laughs> I said, no, we, we weren't poor. They hadn't invented computers. And he says, well, Grandpa, when you were a little boy, had they invented electricity? I said, yes, my friend Thomas discovered it. I said, of course we had electricity. He said, well, what were you people thinking? If you had electricity, you should have had computers. <laughs> Human beings have gone through some transformation in the past five million years. Humans, as we know it, as we see ourselves now, maybe been around about 100,000 years or so. There's a little overlap, you can see, with Neanderthals. But, you know, more or less, we've been in, in this form for about 100,000 years. You can see kind of the, the, what the anthropologists tell us is the timetable overlap here in this chart. The important thing to realize is that, yes, we may have gone through some transformations, but in the world of our ancient ancestors, if we go back to our ancient ancestors, they lived in an environment very different than the one we live in today. It was an environment of scarcity. It was a harsh environment where the vast majority of people ever born on this planet, somewhere around 90, 95% of those, all the humans ever born never lived to reproduce. They never lived long enough to pass on their genes, their DNA. Okay? Your ancestors did. You're the end product of thousands of generations of successful sexual reproduction. If any one of your ancestors hadn't made it, you wouldn't be here. So, yeah, the few, the proud, the survivors. <laughs> But that environment was very, very difficult. And it, what was difficult was it was hard to get enough to eat and it was hard to avoid being eaten. In fact, the human population on the planet was thought to be around 50,000 humans on the whole planet for most of our history. And in fact, about 70,000 years ago, they tell us that when the Toba supervolcano erupted in Indonesia, it changed the climate for a while and it made it so difficult that there were less than 10,000 humans left. Our species almost bit the dust. We almost went extinct. Below the 10,000 creatures is considered kind of that critical level. Um, but somehow, we survived. We didn't, we didn't go extinct, witness the fact that we're still here. And it's thought the reason humans were able to survive was not because of our physical prowess, but because we were, by nature, innovators. Humans have been using tools in a sophisticated way for at least a million years, according to anthropologists. And we've been using fire to cook our food, provide light, heat, and protection for over half a million years. Half a million years is longer than we've been humans in this form. And the most powerful tool the planet's ever seen showed up around 100,000 years ago, coincidentally enough, about the time that humans in our form have been present. And that tool was language, because language allowed us to accumulate and pass on information in a geometric fashion. So something that might take an individual a lifetime to accomplish could be passed on in a few minutes just by listening to somebody speak. These innovations, tools and fire and language, were hugely powerful. And they allowed our species to survive just barely. Just barely, because all throughout this time, up to 100,000 years ago, there's still only 50,000 humans on the planet. We were surviving, but we were not thriving. And then we made the connection between the seed and the plant. Agriculture was discovered, and that changed everything, as far as we were concerned. Because now we were able to transform ourselves from nomadic creatures that wandered the globe, hunting, gathering, struggling to get enough to eat, to being able to settle down in one place dramatically increased the amount of caloric density available to us through agriculture, and our species began to thrive. This is a picture I took in Bhutan a few years ago. This is a country that's only had electricity for a little over a decade, and 93% of people in this country are still subsistence farmers. And you can see them hand harvesting Bhutanese red rice here. Uh, you could do this whole country with a harvester machine in a weekend, but you know they're out there hand cutting it and beating it with leather, <laughs> leather straps, and it, they got to hustle because if they don't get this stuff taken in before the rains come, everybody's going to be hungry come the end of the season. Here they are hand planting rice. 
Um, I was recently, this is actually taken in Vietnam. I, I was in Vietnam last year and I saw the first automatic rice harvesting and planting machines go into, into function. And they can, with one machine, they can plant and harvest rice with about 10% increased efficiency with two people, what used to take 100 people. So it's going to be a transformative in terms of what people are doing. And, uh, the printing press came about, about 600 years ago. Now, the printing press was a big deal because we were able to quantify the products of language. So now it wasn't just passing it off by oral history. We were able to write it down. There was a certain efficiency of that. But there was a problem. Because 600 years ago, just because somebody wrote something down didn't mean it was true <laughs> any more than it does today. So we needed to figure out a way to differentiate fact from fantasy. Because you see, human beings have this nasty tendency to make a certain type of error. It's called an error of attribution, where we misattribute cause and effect. So we needed a system to help us differentiate fact from fantasy. And that system is a mathematically based system that we call science. And science has been around for about 400 years. About the four, last 400 years, we've been using scientific methodology to try to help us answer questions. Now, it doesn't answer every question, but it does a really good job of answering certain types of questions. And we've become quite dependent on this type of thinking to answer certain questions. Now, the Industrial Revolution, the next big human innovation, was only about 200 years ago. Think about that. That's not just a drop of water in an ocean full of, um, in an ocean in terms of biological time relatively recent, but in that last 200 years, we have transformed the planet. So the planet we live on now is not the planet of our ancient ancestors. We've changed everything, not to mention did we come up with agriculture, but then we learned how to process food in a way that transformed food into something very different than what we might have eaten 200 years ago. This is a curve, this is a population curve of humans. On this axis, you notice that the population of humans, this is in billions, was very, very small up until the time of agriculture where it started to rise. Okay? By the time of Jesus Christ, you have 250 million people living on the planet. Today, 7 billion and counting. Now, if this curve were applied to an insect population, it would be known as an infestation curve. <laughs> Here you are, here's your parents. If either of your parents hadn't survived, you wouldn't be here, correct? Here's your grandparents. If any one of your grandparents hadn't made it, you wouldn't be here because your parents went down the chain. And that goes on and on and on and on back for a thousand generations. The characteristics that allowed your ancient ancestors to survive are the same characteristics that are embedded in your DNA today. And I'll show you something. The way the brain directs the body into what to do, that's, that's how you know what to do, is you have this large bulbous neuronal net at the end of your spinal column called the brain. <laughs> and the brain is kind of the director of the body. Now that brain is designed for an environment of our ancient ancestors, because there's been little biological change, anthropological change, functional change in, say, the last 100,000 years in the human brain. The brain was designed for an environment of scarcity. The environment of scarcity meant, OK, get enough to eat and don't get eaten. That's essentially what your programming is about. <laughs> Notice the, this is a representation of a modern brain. And here's the representation of a brain of a human 100,000 years ago. What do you notice? They're the same. They're exactly the same brain. Anthropologists will tell you there's no anthropological or morphological difference. How come the brain hasn't changed in the last 100,000 years? It's not enough time, biologically speaking. Biological change takes place over millennia, not over 100,000 years. In fact, here's a curve. This is 5 million years ago. Humans were small and their brains were small. By uh, habilis here, we've got humans are still pretty small, but the brain getting bigger, right? This is evolution above the neck, below the neck, the brain side, or above the neck, below the neck. So humans got bigger, and then the brain caught up. This is where we are now. There's no difference in human brain size now between, say, 100,000 years ago, and presumably no functional difference. So what's the big deal? So what? Our brains haven't changed in 100,000 years. The brains were designed for the environment of 100,000 years ago. 
not the environment of today. And that has huge implications. For example, if we took a baby from today and transported it back to 100,000 years ago, that baby would have been raised by that family without any knowledge that there's been any difference. Conversely, if we took a baby somehow magically from 100,000 years ago and brought it into our environment today, you would not be able to tell the difference in terms of that child's development. It would be just as annoying as a little kid. It would be just as obnoxious as a teenager. It would have exactly the same bad habits as children do today because the brain that directs all that stuff has not changed. This is the environment the brain was designed for. This is the one it lives in. This is the environment we live in today, and the implication of that is very significant because our brains, which direct our behavioral tendencies, is not designed for the current environment, and it presents a problem, which I'm going to demonstrate. <laughs> How does the brain direct the body? How does it do it? How does the brain tell the body what to do so it engages in behaviors that favor survival and reproduction? Well, it does it neurochemically. You all know what that molecule is, right? Here, let me give you the chemical formula. I'm sure that'll help. Dopamine. Dopamine. C8H11NO2. You all remember your chemistry class? Okay. Dopamine is, there's actually a lot of chemicals the brain uses, but this is the dominant chemical. It's associated with something you know as pleasure. The more dopamine, the more pleasure. The more dopamine, the more intense the pleasure. When you do something that favors survival or reproduction, your brain rewards you with pleasure. It squirts out some dopamine, and you feel pleasure. So what are the two behaviors that humans have to engage in in order to live to reproduce? Food, eating, and sex. Food and sex, food and sex, food and sex. Those are the normal stimulants of dopamine for human beings, unless you happen to be a male. Then it's, well, then it's sex and <laughs> food. But food and sex, sex and food, whatever order you put them in, those are the only natural stimulants of dopamine. Okay? And let's think why. Let's say feeding behavior wasn't reinforced with pleasure. Do you think you'd remember to do it? You know, there's a lot of work to, you know, shopping and chopping, climbing the tree and cutting and, you know, defending it. And, you know, if there wasn't some kind of reward, you'd probably say, ah. And what about sex? Do you really think people would do all that huffing and puffing and sweating if there wasn't some kind of reward? I don't think so. Uh-uh. It turns out, remember I said humans are innovators? Huh. It turns out there's a few chemicals that just so happen to stimulate that dopamine cascade in the brain of humans. Ooh. Alcohol is one of them. When you drink alcohol, you like the way it makes you feel because it stimulates dopamine in your brain. You get a pleasure response, a disinhibition of social pain, etc. The problem is it's an artificial stimulation of dopamine. And if you keep drinking long enough, what happens? you can become physically addicted to alcohol. We call it alcoholism. Where now you have to drink, not just to feel good, but you have to keep drinking to avoid feeling bad, the hallmark of addiction. Okay, you can become addicted to it. And in fact, if you give enough people enough alcohol over enough time, a significant percentage of those, a dominant percentage, will become addicted. Okay? And it's not just alcohol. It turns out there's things like methamphetamines, Materials that you can inject directly into your veins. You know what this is? No, it's not cheese. <laughs> cheese has casomorphine. That's a whole different thing. No, this is cocaine. Oh, cocaine is fabulous as far as an artificial stimulant of dopamine in the brain. It's one of the most effective, most powerful ways of artificially stimulating uh, dopamine in the brain. In fact, not that we would ever do this, but if you canalize the rats of a, br a brain of a rat, and you give it access to cocaine when it presses a little light, it will press the light till it's dead. It won't stop for anything. It's so heavily reinforcing. In fact, if we quantify and look at how much dopamine is squirted out by the brain when you have an orgasm during sex versus when you smoke cocaine, there's 10 times more dopamine secreted smoking cocaine than having an orgasm during sex. I was giving a talk in Los Angeles a few years ago to a large group, and I pointed this out, 
And an older woman, must have been in her late 70s, early 80s, white hair, stood up and she said, excuse me, Dr. Goldhammer, where do you get cocaine? <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> What's this? Crystal meth. Crystal meth, that's the poor man's cocaine. What's this? Oh, 60s people, yeah. <laughs> LSD, PCP, ecstasy, yeah, some, some of you know. Opium. And none of you know about this, do you? And heroin. Hmm. Okay, if that was the end of the story, we could just say, well, drugs are bad, just say no. <laughs> and then we could stop the talk. It per turns out, though, it's not just those drugs that... Now, remember, we spend inordinate amounts of effort finding every single chemical that can artificially stimulate dopamine in the brain. If it's there, we found it. We've been licking frogs and doing all kinds of stuff trying to figure out how to induce that artificial dopamine stimulation. It turns out that there are a few chemicals that can actually be added to the food supply that work on exactly the same neurochemical cascade. And we know if we take these chemicals and we add them, say, for example, to the feed of mice or rats, it will dramatically increase the feeding behavior because it dramatically increases the dopamine secretion in the brains of those animals. Because it's not just dopamine for humans, it's all animals that share the same mechanisms. So if we take a rat and we give it all the food at once, ad libitum eating, it'll get to a certain size, okay? But if we add these chemicals to that rat chow, those rats will increase their weight 49% in just 60 days, okay? They'll get huge. Now, are the rats getting huge because of psychological reasons? Is it because mommy rat didn't love them enough? Daddy rat loved them too much? Huh? Or is it biological reasons? Because we artificially stimulate the opening cascade of the brain, they overeat and they get fat. Oh, and what about birds? We can feed birds ad libitum, they get to a certain size. We put these chemicals in their food, they'll get so fat they can't fly. But we're not birds and mice, are we? We're exempt from the laws of physics and thermodynamics as humans, right? And this, these people that designed this coffee shop, they were just thinking about ergonomics, weren't they? <laughs> or was it possible that in the 1930s or 40s, people's posteriors were of somewhat different proportion? People are getting fatter. It's affecting women. It's affecting men. It's affecting children. And the consequences of it are devastating. And it is, in fact, the pleasure trap. Because people are literally being trapped by pleasure from the artificial stimulation of dopamine in their brains as a consequence of chemicals that are being added to our feed supply. Because we're not just putting these chemicals in the rats and birds, we're putting it in our food. And we're doing it purposely and knowledgeably. Food manufacturers absolutely understand this mechanism and they are purposely putting in the chemicals that are needed to maximize your dopamine secretion in your brain. What's one of the chemicals that have been added to the feed supply of humans, C6H1206. You know what this is? Sugar. A white crystalline material doesn't appear in nature in this form. You have to manufacture it. Very concentrated. We smash it up into little cubes. We feed it to people. Now we're feeding people over 150 pounds per year on average. Now I was thinking about that. I don't eat any of it, which means who's eating my share? <laughs> We've increased high fructose corn syrup, a heavily federally subsidized, particularly noxious version of this concentrated sweetener, by over a thousand percent. We subsidize it so we make it really, really cheap, so highly processed, health compromising foods are very, very affordable. What's another chemical? This is the chemical that we add to food besides sugar CH3, CH2, 7CH, 7OOH. What is that? Oil. This doesn't exist in nature in this form. When's the last time you fell into an oil pond? <laughs> or it started raining olive oil or something, you know? No, this is a very concentrated substance, nine calories per gram. 
that we use uh, in very many obnoxious ways. In fact, what we do a lot of times is we'll actually heat it up to high temperature and stick things into it, act as sponges to soak up the grease. What do you think a French fry or a potato chip is? It's just a little potato starch using as a sponge to soak up grease. Instead of eating those kind of foods, I suggest you find the deep fryer, stick your head in it and suck, because that's what you're doing. <laughs> What's another chemical we add to food? Salt. salt. Salt used to be such a rare and precious commodity that it was used as a means of exchange. Worth his salt. Um, but we learned how to process materials like seawater and make uh, ubiquitous amounts of it. Because salt is such a rare and precious commodity, our bodies were designed to detect it at very small quantity and hold on to it and value it. Okay? So when you eat large amounts of salt, your genes are designed to hold on to that salt. Your blood volume goes up, your blood pressure goes up, you get edema, swelling, congestion, it's a mess. But you can take any highly processed piece of crap food and make it taste pretty good to your brain by putting the oil, salt, and the sugar on it because it artificially stimulates dopamine secretion, which food manufacturers find very favorable because then they don't have to use fresh foods or good tasting foods. They can take anything that acts as a carrier agent and you'll be foolish enough to buy it and eat it. And we do, in huge quantities, highly refined foods containing oil, salt, and sugar, uh, foods containing flour products, and foods containing dairy products, including uh, butter, yogurt, and cheese, have become the dominant source of calories in our diet. In fact, 93% of all calories consumed by humans in industrialized countries now are either animal foods, that is meat, fish, phallics, or dairy products, or pleasure trap chemicals. Now that means 7% of calories, of all the calories consumed, come from fruits and vegetables. Now, I know some of you are vegans, so you are optimists, always trying to look at the positive. And you look up there and you see 7% and think, hey, there's still hope. Let's keep hope alive. <laughs> and I don't mean to rain on your parade, but of that 7%, one third of it is just one vegetable called potatoes, which are served almost exclusively as french fries and potato chips. Fruits and vegetables no longer make a statistically significant component in the diet of people living in industrialized countries. They are the decoration on the plate. They don't even count statistically. It is the pleasure trap. The dietary pleasure trap is the artificial stimulation of dopamine in the brain that comes from adding these chemicals, oil, salt, and sugar, to the diet of people. And what you get is a cascading episode, epidemic of obesity. It's the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. It's why people are fat. It's why people are sick. And the only answer is getting rid of the chemicals that artificially stimulate the brain. If you have an alcoholic, do you tell the alcoholic, well, you just drink too much. All you have to do is learn to drink less, and you'll be fine. So just drink beer and wine. Here, just put your alcohol in a smaller cup instead of that big mug and use a spoon and sip it and then put your fork down or a spoon down between each sip and then you won't be a drunk anymore. Is that what we tell our alcoholic friends and patients? Just drink a little less and swirl it around in your mouth a few times before you swallow it and you'll be fine? Why don't we tell alcoholics they just need to learn to drink less? Because it doesn't work. Okay, in fact, if you're an alcoholic and you go to the Betty Ford Center and spend $44,000 for a 30-day inpatient program and then you go to 90 visits in 90 days to a 12-step program and you have family support and you're motivated, we know statistically the odds of your failure exceed 70%. And that's amongst the more effective treatment programs. But if you're obese and you go to the doctor and say, doctor, I'd like to lose this 100 pounds and keep it off, that doctor knows that there's a 93 to 97% failure rate. Virtually nobody. Uh, is successful. Why? Because we tell fat people, oh, you're fat, just eat less. Eat the same stuff, just eat less of it. Put your food on a smaller plate. Chop your food into little bites. Put your fork down between, you won't be fat anymore. Does that work? It doesn't ever work. It can't work. Because the reason the alcoholic's in trouble is because they're taking a chemical that's fooling their brain chemistry, and the reason the person's fat is doing it because they're eating either so oil, salt, or sugar that's fooling their brain chemistry. And it's not going to work. It never has worked. It's never going to work. But we keep telling people the same thing. The way it works with food is based on caloric density. Why would it be based on caloric density? Think back to our ancient ancestors, environment of scarcity. Do you think that our ancestors that knew the difference between high caloric density foods and low caloric density foods might have had an advantage? Salad has 100 calories a pound. How many pounds of salad a day does somebody have to eat to survive? You need 2,000 calories a day on average. 20 pounds a day. Can you eat 20 pounds a day of salad? If you start at 6 a.m. and you eat all day long till midnight, can you eat 20 pounds? No! What do you think? Your brain is stupid? 
<laughs> your brain looks at salad and says, uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, I could eat it. <laughs> and if there's nothing else, fine, I'll eat some salad, but I'm not getting excited about it. Because at 100 calories a pound, it's not that valuable as far as your brain's concerned. Now, fruit, on the other hand, has 300 calories a pound, three times the caloric density. What tastes better, fruit or salad? Why? It has sugar, therefore, it results in the secretion of more dopamine. Because your brain says, oh, three times the caloric density, I only need seven pounds a day of that. It's still a full time job, but at least I could do it. <laughs> it's, it's conceivable, it's possible. And so it's going to give you a little bit more reward for eating something like sugar, like fruit than it would giving you something like salad, which really just has some nutrients, but not a lot of caloric density. But if you're you know, hungry, you'd really rather have something with a higher caloric density. Potatoes, rice, and beans, for example, have 500 calories a pound. You don't need four pounds of that a day to eat, to survive. You could, you could actually do that. And so you know, potatoes, rice, and beans are going to be a little bit more appealing to you, aren't they? And there's more dopamine per mouthful for that than there is for the salad. But what if I invented an artificial food? Now, this does not exist in nature, but let's just say we came up with something somehow that had 1,200 calories a pound. Do you think you'd like it? Do you think it would stimulate more dopamine secretion in the brain? Because your brain would go, oh, 1,200 calories a pound. God, I only need a pound and a half of that. That's great. And, it would, and if it was introduced at the World's Fair in the 1850s, do you think people would like really get to like it? And what if we called that food, I don't know, ice cream? <laughs> would people like ice cream? Now, what's interesting about ice cream is it's cold. If you warm it up to room temperature, it's described as sickly sweet. It's so sweet, it makes you sick. Yeah, but when it's cold, it tastes so good. What does it suck sugar out of the atmosphere when it melts? Why does it taste so sickly sweet when it's warm, but it tastes so good when it's cold? It's because you are not designed to detect sugar, something artificially cold. This doesn't exist in nature. There's been no evolutionary pattern to reinforce the ability to differentiate an artificially frozen food. And so what happens when you make ice cream, if you want it to taste good, you have to super saturate it with sugar. You have to get just a ton of sugar in there, otherwise you can't taste it. When you warm it up, you can taste what's there and it makes you sick. It makes you just as sick when it's cold, but you just don't know it because you've bypassed your detection mechanisms. In fact, you are such an energy conserving fat storage device, you can tell the difference blindfolded between chocolate, chocolate, haagen premium ice cream and the diet delight stuff, can't you? <laughs> they can't fool you. What if we came up with a food with a higher caloric density than ice cream? <laughs> Do you think people would like it? Do you think they would call it, I don't know, the staff of life? Crunchy on the outside, soft and hot on the inside. You ever been in a restaurant and they serve it on the table? You haven't even ordered. They put a basket of this, right? It's all covered up. And your brain is saying what? 1,500 calories a pound. <laughs> oh, baby. And you open up that basket, and you have a piece or two or three, don't you? And pretty soon, what do you notice about the bread in the basket? It's gone. It's, go it's all gone. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you open up that napkin, get that thing all spread eagle and naked on the table, and you push it right toward the edge of the table, don't you? Because you're sitting waiting for that waiter. What are you thinking? Does he want a tip or not? <laughs> Finally, the waiter comes away. He almost trips over the basket. He sees it's empty. He looks at you and he says, oh, did you want some more bread? And you have to first do what? Act like you didn't know it was empty. And you look over there and say, oh, well, sure, why not? <laughs> and he brings you some more bread. Do you ever go into the same restaurant and you say, waiter, excuse me, waiter, please bring me three large baked potatoes because I'd like to eat those before I order my dinner. Do you order three large baked potatoes and eat those before you order your dinner? Why don't you eat three large baked potatoes before you order your dinner? Because you'd be too full. Because the human stomach can only handle about three large baked potatoes. That's about 500 calories a potato. If you ate three large baked potatoes, you are physically filled up the space. But the same amount of calories of bread only takes one third of the stomach. And that, you know, that's, that bread has 1,500 calories per pound instead of 500 calories a pound for the potato. And that's before you turn it into a butter boat. <laughs> and you spread coagulated cow pus all over it. So what do you think you're going to be getting fat on? Eating some potatoes or eating bread? Well, okay, sugar we already said at 1,800 calories a pound. So it's really appealing. Do you ever go into that uh, restaurant and just say, oh, there's a nice bowl of sugar, or there's, there's a bunch of packets of, in fact, and just say eat 11 packets of sugar, do you just, do you do that? why not, it's free. They don't even have to charge for it. What's the problem? 
Let me ask you. You ever had one of these? You ever seen this stuff? Coca-Cola, the old style Coke, 12 ounce, used to have 11 teaspoons of sugar. And they, why didn't they put 12 in? It's because it used to come out of solution and people would see it on the bottom of the bottle and go, oh my God, they're putting sugar in this stuff. <laughs> but then with a little more, more phosphoric acid, I think they can get like 12 in, so the new Coke's better, sweeter. A little, but they used to put cocaine in there, but now they use caffeine. It's actually more effective. Um, it used to be that a 12 ounce Coke was a special treat for a kid, wasn't it? But not anymore. Now it's a 55 ounce big gulp with free refills. And that's really not enough. We have the big gulp, the super gulp, the double gulp, the express gulp. Pretty soon we're going to need to have a bucket. <laughs> and I think the way that people are going to hurt their backs in the future is going to the 7 Eleven and getting a Coke. Twenty-five percent of calories consumed by teenagers in the United States come from the sugar and soda pop alone. Just the sugar and soda pop, not the sugar and everything else they're eating. But we don't know why kids are getting fatter and sicker. It's a mystery. Oh. Quiz. What tastes better, salad or chocolate? <laughs> yeah, she's drooling right there. She's not even... Chocolate has 2,500 calories per pound. 25, you might as well, you know, patients say to me, why can't I like chocolate? I say, well, you want to have chocolate, that's fine. We'll just change the form you take it in. You melt it down, you rub it all over your belly and hips. And then when you're done, you can wash it off and not carry it around all week. They did a survey of women, not men, just women. And they said to women, what would you rather do? Have mad, hot, passionate sex or eat chocolate? Two most common responses, what kind of chocolate and how many pieces are we talking about? <laughs> Potatoes taste good, but potato chips taste great. And when they say, bet you can't just eat one, you think they're kidding? Potatoes have 500 calories a pound, potato chips, 2,500 calories a pound. Five times the quark density, therefore, five times the dopamine secretion. Yeah, you can tell the difference. Notice my subliminal teaching techniques. Green, healthy foods, you know, one to 500 calories a pound, and then red for pleasure trap foods. Dramatically more caloric density, so they taste better. Remember, when you say that tastes better, what you're saying is, well, that results in more dopamine secretion in my brain. 93% of all calories are pleasure trap calories or animal foods, okay? That's, that's why, you ever wonder why you go into the store and you, and you have trouble finding anything? Go out to a restaurant, there may be nothing you can eat. Because that's what people eat. If you w would like to read a book that will bend your mind and will not tell you what you want to hear, but will tell you what you need to know, read our book, The Pleasure Trap, Mastering the Hidden Force That Undermines Health and Happiness. If you want to learn how to cook foods that taste decent without oil, salt, or sugar, we have two cookbooks, our original, The Health Promoting Cookbook, and our new book, Bravo. These are all vegan, SOS-free recipes. We have these in the back. What does that say? Five minutes? Okay. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do now is stop my babbling and I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can in five minutes. I'd like to point out a couple things though. If you don't get your questions answered, I'm going to be back there in the corner where our booth is. I'll be happy to answer your questions, sign books, do all that too. You're welcome to call us at the True North Health Center. You can call me at the True North Health Center. If you fill out what are called the registration forms on our website at truenorthhealth.com, I'll, it collects your medical history. I will give you a free phone consultation. I'll try to answer your questions and tell you whether or not there's anything you can do or if it's helpless and hopeless and you might as well just, you know, jump off the bridge. <laughs> so, um, so you can get, if you don't get your questions answered, please feel free to give me a call. I'm more, more than happy to, to, uh, to do that. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Excellent question. We were designed to eat everything we could get our hands on, okay? You physiologically can break down just about anything because it was so hard to get enough to eat, the few that could handle a wide variety of stuff. But remember, in our history, animal food never made a significant role for most humans in their diet. We were more scavengers. We might get the bone marrow out of the bones of the animals that were scavenged by the real carnivores. 
we would eat anything and everything. And if you lived in the world of our ancient ancestors, the small amount of occasional products may not necessarily have been a health limitation. Any source of calories that allows you to get to life may have been beneficial. Now today, we don't live in that environment. People will also argue it's not just health, but moral, ethical, and spiritual issues. They're saying it's not nice to take sentient creatures, torture them all their life, kill them and eat them, because then you, know, you don't get to go to heaven or whatever. And I would argue that being a vegan might help you get into heaven, but it will not delay how quickly you go there unless you adopt a vegan SOS free diet. Because I got news for you, a lot of this highly processed vegan crap that's being foisted on people is probably at least as health compromising as the animal foods. So what we want to do is encourage people not just to give up the dead decaying flesh, but also to adopt a health promoting diet. Fresh fruits and vegetables, grains and legumes, nuts and seeds, whole natural foods without all the heated, peated, trop, jice, processed crap that people are trying to sell you. Yes? Well, okay, so we, our cookbooks are completely gluten-free. We don't use glutinous grains because we have a significant percentage of the population that has some gluten sensitivities. So we don't use wheat, rye, barley, those kind of products in any of the stuff that we do. I think that you have to, you have to read a little bit carefully because 100% of the population isn't necessarily gluten sensitive. But for those that are, this is a devastating and significant issue. And it's easy enough to get rid of because most of that highly processed flour-based product we shouldn't be eating anyway, regardless of whether you're gluten sensitive or not. Yes? Salt is salt. It doesn't matter how much you pay for it, if the guru blessed it, if it's colored pink. <laughs> sodium chloride is sodium chloride. It dissociates into sodium and chloride. Salt is salt is salt. We want to avoid added salts. You will neuroadapt. It takes about a month to neuroadapt to a low salt diet. If you want to do it quicker, come to the True North Health Center. We'll put you on a fast. You'll neuroadapt very quickly. Yes? Um, Diadamo's stuff um, is there's absolutely no scientific support to for the vast majority of what Diodamo claims in his book. I just summarize it that way. It's a crock of crap. Yes. Please end. Okay. Thank you.